Title is Paper 73, Part 4. We'll start with Paragraph 13. And in front of you is the Federalist uh, Papers, the edition by Jacob E. Cook. Um, again, to recommend to you to read the introduction and also the bibliography of all of these different editions of the Federalist Papers. Uh, paragraph 13, but the convention have pursued a mean in this business, which will both facilitate the exercise of the power vested in this respect in the executive magistrate and make its efficacy to depend on the sense of a considerable part of the legislative body. Instead of an absolute negative, it is proposed to give the ex executive the qualified negative already described. So it's not an absolute veto, it's a qualified veto because it can be overridden by two-thirds of both houses of the Congress. Instead of an absolute negative, it is proposed to give the executive the qualified negative already described. This is a power which would be much more readily exercised than the other. A man who might be afraid to defeat a law by his single veto, veto is capitalized here, might not scruple to return it for reconsideration. reconsideration. Subject to being finally rejected only in the event of more than one-third of each house concurring in the sufficiency of his objections. He would be encouraged by the reflection that if his opposition should prevail, it would embark it on a very respectable proportion of the legislative body, whose influence would be united with his in supporting the propriety of his conduct in the public opinion. A direct and categorical negative has something in the appearance of it more harsh and more apt to irritate than the mere suggestion of argumentative objections to be approved or disapproved by those to whom they're addressed. So if we'd given him an absolute veto, then it would have actually come across like we are giving an overwhelming power to the executive instead of the legislative branches or dividing powers. But this way, we've made sure that the president has to first make sure that uh, he's not going to issue a veto that he knows two-thirds of both houses can easily override because he doesn't want to look bad. So he's not going to do this just out of whim. You know, he's going to be thinking about it hard before he does that. It is to be hoped that it will not often happen that improper views will govern so large a proportion as two-thirds of both branches of the legislature at the same time. And this, too, in defiance of counterpoising weight of the executive. It is at any rate far less probable that this should be the case than that such views should taint the resolutions and conduct of a bare majority. A power of this nature in the executive will often have a silent and unperceived though forcible operation. When men engaged in unjustifiable pursuits are aware that obstructions may come from a quarter which they cannot control, they will often be restrained by the bare apprehension of, of, of opposition from doing what they would with eagerness rush into, if no such external impediments were to be feared. Next paragraph, this qualified negative, as has been elsewhere remarked, in this state vested in a council consisting of the governor 
with the chancellor and judges of the Supreme Court, or any two of them. It has been freely employed upon a variety of occasions and frequently with success. And its utility has become so apparent that persons who in compiling the Constitution were violent opposers of it have from experience become its declared admirers. And here in the footnote, he's going to name the anti-federalists that has had this change of heart. It's Mr. Abraham Yates, he says, a warm opponent of the plan of the convention is of this number. He's the one who at one time, according to this last sentence, uh, became so apparent that persons who in compiling the Constitution were violent opposers of it, have from experience become its declared admirers. So he's looking at how uh, the Constitution of the state of New York was written, and reflecting on that, he says, now the same person that's criticizing us for this Constitution, he's not looking back and see that he was having the same criticism from the New York Constitution, but now he has totally changed his mind. And in the last paragraph, he hints at um, how the federal convention, federal constitutional convention, constitutional, the Constitution written in the Philadelphia Convention, the new Constitution, somewhat in deciding to uh, take up the model, follow the model of uh, Massachusetts rather than his home state of New York. And here's what he says. I have in another place remarked that the convention in the formation of this part of their plan had departed from the model of the Constitution of this state, our state of New York, in favor of that of Massachusetts. Two strong reasons may be imagined for this preference. One is that the judges, who are to be the interpreters of the law, might receive an improper bias from having given a previous op opinion in their revisionary capacity, capacities. The other is that by being often associated with the executive, they might be induced to embark too far in the political views of that magistrate, and thus a dangerous combination might by degrees be cemented between the executive and the judiciary departments. It's impossible to keep the judges too distinct from every other avocation than that of expounding the laws. It is a peculiarly dangerous, it is, pecu it is peculiarly dangerous to place them in a situation to be either corrupted or influenced by the executive. So he says, in our state of New York, We've got the judges and the uh, council mixed in with some of the works that the executive does. And we have messed up that way, but in this new constitution that we've written, we followed uh, the example of Massachusetts. And also, as I've told you before, in the Massachusetts actually uh, wrote up their constitution. They drew up their constitution in a convention that met in Boston in 1779-1780, and then they sent it to different towns for it to be ratified. So the United States Constitution that came out of Philadelphia followed that model. Because said, here, we've written this constitution in this convention, and we're going to send it to different ratifying conventions, special ratifying conventions in different states to be examined and ratified or rejected. We're not going to send it to the state legislatures because then it won't be the supreme law of the land. We want to go back to the people and ask them through their delegates to tell us what they think. And also here, he talks about that qualified negative, the uh, qualified veto in the state of New York 
has been given to the hands of a council, which includes the governor, the judges, some judges. Uh, here he says, with chancellor and judges of the Supreme Court. He says, we have found out that this is a mistake, whereas the, whereas the Massachusetts Constitution has done it the same way we have proposed in our new Constitution. So we've learned from our mistakes, and we are not going to repeat them. That is one of the great advantages of, advantages of this new Constitution, he says. Just remember that all of these editions of the Federalist Papers and all of the other ones that I've shown you, they all have wonderful bibliography. I recommend books for you to read. And uh, if you so choose and if you want to delve deeper, you can find those titles and read them. I showed you in a separate video some of the books that I've come across and also these these uh, different editions also recommend them. That might be helpful to you. 